Yeah, sure. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salat, salat, alhamdulillah. Feminism started as a, a weapon against uh, non-white people. <laughs> That's pretty much the origins of feminism as a attack uh, in the colonial project. Uh, so you had Europeans, uh, enlightened Europeans who were part of this liberal secular project trying to colonize the rest of the world. And this is known as the, what was known as the white man's burden. And it was racialized. It was this idea that the white European man uh, is uh, intellectually superior and has a higher IQ and the uh, European mind is scientific and is best able to determine the right way to live, as we talked about in the, in the previous discussion on liberalism. And so they want to export this. This was their burden to civilize the rest of humanity and bring them into the light of reason. And part of this project uh, was to criticize family practices, basically to look at these other cultures and say, look how backwards they are. Look how they treat their women. Okay, that was a big component of it. And it also generated a lot of justification for the colonial project, because it tapped into this kind of savior mindset, like we need to go save these women from these evil men. Right. And there's a book uh, that is pretty well known. It's called Do Muslim Women Need Saving? And it talks about the more modern context in the run up to the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in the past 20 years, where a lot of the justification for that was these Muslim women are being oppressed by Muslim men. These Muslim women are being subjugated in their homes. They have to dress like this with the hijab and the niqab. They are not allowed to just move around freely. They can't go and marry whoever they want. They need like a wali. So this is oppression and we need to save those Muslim women. And that generated a lot of support for the war in some segments of Western society in America and in Europe. And, but this is not something new. It didn't just start with the Iraq war in 2003 or the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. It actually predates that to the beginning of the colonial period, which was uh, in, back at the end of the 18th century. Uh, this is So then what happened, though, is that that weapon that was being used against Muslims and other, like the Chinese as well, certain aboriginals as well, Native Americans, the same arguments that they make against Muslims, like, oh, Muslims abuse women because of polygamy, for example, or because of like inheritance uh, law and marriage law, this is oppressive. Those same practices to a certain extent exist in for native many native american tribes existed for many kinds of uh, traditional cultures so all of these arguments that they've been using against muslims they were also using as all of these different uh, non-european cultures and people in an effort to colonize the entire world but then what started happening um, towards the end of the 19th century those arguments now were being picked up by uh, white women and European women. And so then they said, look, you're advocating so much for the rights of these Muslim women or these brown women. What about our rights? And we want this and we want that. And we want equality here and there and that. So basically the weapon was turned against uh, them. And we're still seeing that today, like those same kinds of destruction, like the destruction that feminism has wrought on uh, people around the world and cultures around the world <clears throat> now more recently in the past hundred years is being turned against uh, America and the West in general. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. So that's like the untold story of feminism. Like the idea that, Oh, feminism was just women who wanted to vote. Like that's, that's like a cartoon caricature. Like <laughs> that's not really like the true full story. Like, the original feminists were the colonizers, um, these European men who want to save, you know, quote unquote, save Muslim women as an excuse to control and take over and kill Muslims. So for a Muslim to be a feminist is like the most ironic thing 
And it's the most backwards and contradictory thing. Like no two things could be more incompatible. And it's, it's not even necessarily subtle. It's like very obvious. So, and, and then the way that feminism operates nowadays is to throw shade, if you want to put it like that, on the entire Islamic tradition, because feminists say that, look, we can't really trust information and knowledge that's coming from men. Like that's just a male bias and that's mansplaining. So when we have all of the greatest scholars of Islam were men, right? They, they were men. Like you'll talk about someone like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah or Imam Ghazali or Ibn Hajar or on and on. All of the ulama, the, like the founders of the uh, four madhahib, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and so forth. There were men. Where's, where are the women in this? Not to say that there weren't women scholars in Muslim history, they were, but the top scholars, just in terms of their sheer knowledge, they were men. Uh, the final messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad, he was a man. So this is a problem for a kind of feminist equality understanding, right? Uh, because you think that if it's coming from a man, that's a male bias, and this is patriarchy, and this is structural oppression. So you'll see many of these Muslim feminists who claim to be Muslim, they'll reject all of the Islamic tradition. They'll reject all of the Islamic tradition. They'll say, this is just patriarchal nonsense. We don't need <laughs> the Islamic tradition because it's male bias. We'll just go to the Quran itself directly. But then there's a problem because in the Quran, Allah, the uh, pronoun in Arabic that's used for Allah is huwa. Huwa means he. So Allah used the preferred pronoun uh, that is used to refer to Allah by Allah in the Quran is huwa, it's a male pronoun. So then you have some feminists who have a problem with this and they'll say, no, my Allah is a she. My Allah is a mm. she. And you had uh, Rashida Tlaib, the uh, congresswoman from Michigan who became famous for some reason as like a Muslim congresswoman. Uh, she actually went on record and said that, no, I'm a feminist and my Allah is a she. So now you're disagreeing with the words of the Quran. And this is clear blasphemy. You want to change the words of the Quran. So that means you have a problem uh, at that level. So that, this is how feminism, like the word that I use for it, it's like the road to apostasy. You get on the feminist track, it might start off simple, like, oh, you know, I think that there needs to be more women's programs in the masjid or in the community like we need more women's programs that could be a good effort or a good initiative to have mm. resources dedicated to like educating muslim women and so forth. fine that's good uh, but then if you take it too far and you start drinking the kool-aid and buying this ideology uh, at its face value then step by step by step it's going to lead you to have a, eventually have a problem with the scholars of islam to eventually having a problem with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was a man and he had uh, 11 wives, for example. And then you're going to even have a problem with Allah himself. Mm -hmm. And you have feminists like Amina Wadud. She became infamous. Uh, she's an academic. She wrote a book. And in that book, she says, we have to be able to say no to the Quran. We're going to say no to the Quran because sometimes the Quran is not going to be just. So you as an individual woman of color, a proud woman of color, you should be able to say no to the Quran. So this is clear kufr. Mashallah, what a strong independent woman. Yeah. <laughs> I 